Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Road to AWS. I wish my subscribers and my viewers a very happy new year and a very prosperous new year 2020. God bless you with all the happiness in life. And if you're new to the channel, please be my guest and I welcome you dearly. So what we are doing here is a full-fledged effort towards a goal that we have to get AWS certified in 2020 and finish it on a high. I would want you to watch the initial episodes of the series to get a better context of the topic that we are going to discuss today. So without wasting any more time, let's begin the first tutorial for 2020. So in today's chapter, we will discuss a lot of things. I could make this a two part series or might just make it just one. And you can see the bullseye icon here. If you see that, pay full attention to that line. It is a marker for points that are very critical for the certification exam. So let's begin. So we'll start off with something that I left last time. That's the EC2 instance connect. There's one more way you can connect to the EC2 instance from the browser itself. So I'll cover that first. Then we'll have a deep dive into the security group. We'll discuss about the public IP, private IP and the elastic IP. We'll install Apache and Nginx on EC2. And then we'll move forward with the user data and the instance launch modes. Then we'll have a hands-on on the EC2 AMI. So let's jump in. So we had already discussed the fun ways to connect to our EC2 instances over SSH using Windows and Mac. But there was one more way that I had missed out on the last episode, which is the EC2 console. So let's jump right into that. So I don't have any instance right now. So I'll just create an instance immediately. So I'll go ahead and launch instance. I'll choose the uh, Amazon Linux 2 AMI. I'll go for the T2 Micro, which is the free tier one. Nothing to configure here. We have the basic settings already there. Add storage. Yes, it's already there. And we need to add the key pair. I'll go ahead and add it. Then just configure properties. So I'll go ahead and choose the existing one. That's the default one that I already have. Like I, And then you can just review it and launch it. So this is where uh, you need to choose like whether you want to create a new key pair or you can use the existing one that I already have. I'll go ahead and use the existing one that I have. And uh, this is, once you check this, you acknowledge that uh, you still have the private key with yourself and you haven't lost it so that you can actually connect to the EC2 instance from your partial or the terminal that you have. So I have it, so I'll just click on launch instances. So below there you have the view instances button, click on that and you will see the instance getting loaded. So now that our instance is running, you can see the public IP already been mentioned here and everything looks just fine. So what we had already done is we had previously gone on to our console terminals and we had executed the command and we had tried to connect to the EC2 instance. There is one more thing that I wanted to show you. If you go ahead and right click on this and you click on connect or you can select this and you can click on connect here as well and or you can just click on here and you can go here and connect to this as well. So there are three ways you can do the same operation. So just right click on this and just click on connect. You see here connect to your instance heading isn't it there are three methods here the probably the method of how to basically connect which we've already seen that in the previous tutorials uh, but now what we are going to do is we are going to select the third option this is a browser based as such connection where you just need to provide a username which is basically ec2 user and you can just click on connect it does not need any key but it'll still do the job so here you have your ec2 console you can play around with it you can execute whatever you want over the browser so let's move on so let's do a deep dive on the security groups and we'll see what are the additional information that we need to learn for the certification there are a lot of information that we need to cover so sit back grab a cup of coffee or tea or any energy drink that you like and let's get this over with so as we have already discussed security groups acts as a virtual firewall for your instance to control the inbound and outbound traffic so what does inbound and outbound mean is that uh, inbound points to the incoming traffic or the traffic that comes into the host and the outbound points to the outgoing traffic which basically is the requests that are going from the host machine to the outside world so as you can see in the diagram as well we have a ec2 instance and the access is inbound and outbound so by default all the incoming traffic is blocked to the ec2 instance and by default all the outbound traffic from the ec2 instance is allowed we have discussed this previously so you need to remember that you can't create rules that deny access if you wish to block as such for example then you simply don't add a rule that allows it and if you wish to have http access allow port 80 as a part of the security rule 
so there is no restrictions you can add or remove rules at any time so in ec2 if you send a request from your instance the response traffic for that request is allowed to flow in regardless of the inbound security group rule so that is what makes security group stateful and this is achieved by connection tracking so what does it mean so security groups use connection tracking to track information about uh, traffic to and from the instance and security rules are applied based on the connection state of the traffic to determine if the traffic is allowed or denied for example if you take icmp ping command for example if you take icmp ping command and you ping an instance where icmp is added to the inbound security group rule information for that is tracked so it is not considered as a new request but rather it is viewed as an established connection to the instance even if the outbound security rule has not allowed icmp so considering a security group name is unique to the particular vpc this seems to be a bit unclear isn't it so let's check this example table here on the right hand side in the table here we have both inbound and outbound traffic rules so now one thing you need to note down is not all flows of traffic are tracked as in if the security rule permits tcp 80 port for all traffic and from the other end it allows all the outbound traffic then the flow is not tracked so as you can see here the tcp rule that you have the 80 port number and it has all the traffic allowed and you have outbound rule that allows all the traffic then for this the traffic is not tracked by the connection tracker if you see the example here we have security rule tcp and icmp and we have the security rule for the outbound allows all traffic flows tcp traffic on 22 here is tracked because the incoming traffic is not allowed for all ip addresses even though the outbound traffic allows all the traffic ips the tcp rule 80 that you have the http one is not tracked because it has bi-directional allow for all traffic so let's go to the security group server rules. So AWS supports both IPv4 and IPv6. And there is a huge scarcity for IPv4 public addresses now, but uh, we are good. We'll be using IPv4 itself in this tutorial series, so don't worry about that. So the first one we have is a web server rule. We have both TCP 80 and 443 ports that we can allow uh, for all the IP addresses. That is for HTTP and HTTPS respectively the first one is the ipv4 inbound rule where you see the 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0 and the below one is the ipv6 double colon slash 0 that's for allow all inbound traffic on ipv6 addresses and that's how you define uh, ipv6 uh, address basically is double colon slash 0 the next one that you have is the database server rule for database specific uh, security rules you might add rules based on what type of instances you are using so if it is postgres or mysql or ms sql you can see so you can see we have the default port to access the microsoft sql server database and the postgres allowed using the port address mapping with the tcp 1433 for ms sql and 5432 for postgres sql uh, so you can have them uh, allow for scenarios like where uh, you need to just update the particular database over the internet and restrict any other access for that you might as well remove the outbound traffic that allows all traffic so moving on if you wish to connect uh, the instances from the instances with the same security group you can as well do that by adding minus one which means all access and then you can interact between instances with the security group just you need to provide the id of the security group and uh, these are the few points that i mentioned here and uh, you can check the link that i have given below for more details i have just mentioned the ones that are important for the certification exam uh, so moving forward so let's again recap some of the important points that we need to remember for the security groups and uh, so first and foremost security groups control how the traffic flows to and from the ec2 instance or the machine uh, they are like our virtual firewalls so by default all the traffic is blocked on the inbound traffic and by default all the traffic is allowed for the outbound traffic and security groups are attached to a particular region so if you want uh, uh, to use a particular security group that uh, belongs to a particular region then you have to be in that particular region to use it and uh, security groups can be attached to multiple instances and multiple instances can as well have a common security group so yes you can attach a security group to a particular instance and that and that security group can be associated to another instance as well and there can be multiple instances that can have the same security group as well so the next thing is the ec2 instance have no idea what's going on with the security group it just acts as a firewall so if you you make any changes to the security group the ec2 will never know about it it's just like a barrier that you have outside ec2 
which allows the flow of the traffic and the next thing that's a very important thing that we have is to always create a separate security group for s search access so we have talked about security groups right so what we can do is like i can just show you how basically it works so as you can see we have the ec2 instance here and uh, we have the security group uh, mentioned here launch wizard one so i'll just click on this uh, so you see here four things description inbound outbound and tags right so you just need to go to the inbound one to check the inbound traffic so i can just go ahead and edit it and i can make changes to this one so let's first connect to the instance so i have my terminal opened here so what i'm going to do i'm going to just ssh to this ssh i'll provide the key that i have so ec2 hyphen pem and then the username ec2 hyphen user at the rate at the rate the ip address and i'll just hit enter i'll type yes and now i'm able to connect isn't it i'll just exit it i'll go back to the security groups okay and i'll edit this the inbound rule and i will remove this and i'll save it and i'll try to connect it again you're not able to connect it so that means is with the help of the security groups you can restrict access and if you want to allow a particular access to a particular port then you need to specify that and not the other way around so basically it will time out as we i already told you that it will not be able to connect and if i go ahead and edit it again and i add a rule so i go ahead and add a ssh there 22 custom and i'll add the same ipv4 rule and I'll do a SSH to my machine. I'll add the description and I'll just save it. So once I've given this, I'll go back and try to connect. Yes, it does. So that's the important aspect that we need to remember that you add rules to allow a particular protocol, not to deny that. I hope this was clear. So now let's get back to some of the basics before jumping onto the serious stuff. We all know that there are different type of IP addresses, right? So IPv4 and IPv6, but we must also be aware of what are public and private IPs. So let us take a look at this example now. There are two web servers here and they are able to communicate over the cloud or the internet that we have. That is the World Wide Web. But how? The thing is that we see here is that they are using public IPs. As the word suggests, public IPs are the IP addresses that can be accessed over the internet. You can think of them as a mailbox number which anyone can access to communicate with you. So if you have a public IP, anyone can access the data uh, that you are broadcasting if they have sufficient permissions. So in your daily life, you're using Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all these sites have public IP addresses mapped to a DNS or a domain name, so which can be used to access the site. Naming sites is always better because no one would like to remember a huge pile of numbers over a fancy name. So let for example, Google fancy isn't it but what if you are in a private space like office or your private home server then things would be different isn't it if we see here there is a private office internet which has the provision to communicate within its own network but not outside the network without the help of the public internet gateway that's why we call them private they have an isolated scope to be accessed within the network more so the office or the home network and they cannot be accessed globally so you cannot access a private IP from outside its network until and unless you have a VPN connection to its network or something that can grant you access. So let's get some of the basic differences out of the public and private IP. So the first thing is like we have IPv4 uses 32-bit address schema and that allows you to store up to 2 to the power of 32 addresses approximately around 4 billion addresses. On the other hand, IPv6, it is the most recent used of the IP protocols and it uses a 128-bit address schema that will not end in my lifetime at least so and ipv4 are uh, numeric addresses like 192.23.12.2 separated by dot and ipv6 are alphanumeric whose binary bits are separated by a colon and it also contains hexadecimal as we have already discussed a public ip address is an ip address that can be accessed over the internet which is mostly masked by the dns like web server or email server whereas private ip addresses of a system is the ip address which is used to communicate within the same network like an office or a private space and the public ips are globally unique but private ips are unique over the local area network 
and you might have to pay to get a public ip but private ip is usually owned or uh, company managed so there are classes of ip ranges that we have for both public and private ips please go through them uh, for your convenience and uh, the public ips that we have can be geographically located and means you can go over the internet and find from where the ip has come from and who is the host unless it is secured but private ips on the other hand are private and you cannot find them online and this is some of the basic that we wanted to cover so moving forward so now that we are well aware of the security groups and how the access to the instance works i will be referring to them casually if you still feel uh, any doubts please go back to the topic and refresh it again no hard and fast rule to finish it quickly we learn once to never forget again so let's begin assuming that you are a aws web server admin and you create and launch uh, an ec2 instance and i am sitting on the desk other side and you ask me if i can access it i said yes i can with ssh uh, this clears that using the public ip we can access the machine if the right security groups are enabled you went ahead and stopped it i was not able to use it anymore so next you went ahead and started it again but still i wasn't able to use it then you say hey actually you need the new public ip to access it yes that's the problem here because when you start or restart your instance the public ip gets changed and that's a bit of a giveaway isn't it so that's where elastic ip comes in elastic ips can be attached to the instance and even if you restart your instance elastic ips won't change so you need to remember that even if you restart your instance the public ip won't change if you attach it with the elastic ip but is it really a good thing to use them for that we need to see some of the points here Uh, remember when you start and stop ec2 instance the public ip gets changed that's the fact that we need to clear so the elastic ip are basically like a public ip before ip address and you can request them and use it for your ec2 instance and elastic ip address is a static ipv4 address designed for dynamic cloud computing these can be attached to a single instance at a time so if you have attached a elastic ip to one ec2 instance and that cannot be attached to other in the vpc so it's a way of having a fixed public ip for your instance and uh, remember when you attach a elastic ip the public ip that your instance had actually goes back to the public ip pool of the amazon and you cannot reuse the public ipv4 address and you cannot convert ipv4 public address to an elastic ip as well you use it when you associate the elastic ip to your instance and you can disassociate it as well but uh, you will be charged until and unless you terminate or decommission it and one more important thing that you need to remember every elastic ip is region specific but the best thing would be to use a random public ip and throw a dns name onto it so that can be used and you basically get charged for the elastic ip the two points that you need to remember here is your elastic ip will be charged even if it is not attached to a running instance or if it is associated to a stopped instance or unattached network interface as well so based on the points mentioned here you need to remember that your elastic ip won't be charged for the running instance but it may be for any additional elastic ip addresses associated with the instance so basically you need to remember that elastic ips won't be charged if it is associated to a running instance it will be charged if it is attached to a, to a stopped instance or unattached network interface and you can have a maximum of 5 elastic ips so let's see how the elastic ip actually works so you have the public ipv4 address here 13232100 53 and once i'm going to stop it and start it again this is going to change so let's go ahead and stop it yes i'm going to stop it let's wait for it to stop so it has stopped right now i'm going to start it once again just click on start are you sure you want to start these instances yes i want to i'm going to start it again see the instance has started and the ip address has changed now you cannot use it what happens let's go ahead and attach the elastic ip to it so on the left hand side you can see here elastic ips this is the new one so click on this so as you can see here elastic ip address is a static public ipv4 address that you allocate to your aws account and is reachable from the internet so allocate ip address so elastic ip address so amazon pool of ipv4 yeah i'm going to choose it from the amazon's pool of ipv4 addresses and i'm going to allocate it So to attach this IP address to your instance you need to click on this IPv address IP and then you have associate elastic IP address you click on this one and go to particular resource type that you have you choose the instance then you choose the instance that is currently running okay 
choose the private IP. Okay. And click on associate. So now it has been associated. So we'll go back to the instance basically. So now you can see the public IP that we have is 35.154.122.93. And if you go back to the elastic IP again, you see the same IP address here as well. So what you need to do is to basically validate the theory that we had previously assume that it won't change even if we restart it once again. So what you need to do is you need to just stop it. Let's stop it and start it again to check whether the theory is correct or not. So I've stopped it. I'm going to start it again. So now as you can see it did not change and I can go ahead and connect to that. I'll change the IP address here. That's it. So now this is basically connected to the elastic IP. So now what we are going to do is uh, we are going to just terminate or disassociate this basically because I don't want to pay a huge amount of money for this one. I'll just go ahead and terminate this. Click on this release elastic IP. Yes, terminate. So I've released it and you can see the IP address got changed. And once you go back to the elastic IP, what we are going to do is we're going to click on this. So this is not found anymore. So let's move on to a very critical phase of the EC2, which is very important and it carries a lot of weightage for the AWS Solutions Architect certification. So this is AWS EC2 user data. When we have a look at the steps for launching an instance, we see that once we have selected the AMI and the instance type, we move to the third step and there is something there uh, we, that we need to elaborate. Sometimes you may want to have some configurations that you would have liked to be there in your instance when you launch them rather than setting and installing or repeating the same steps again and again for the new machine. And AWS gives you a way to do that. And that's called AWS EC2 user data. So when you launch an instance, you have the provision to pass user data to the instance that can be used to perform common automated configuration tasks and even run scripts after the instance starts. So what it actually in simple term means is it helps you to bootload an instance. What does bootload mean then? You might have heard of CPU bootloading, isn't it? So it's basically you loading essential software information or configuration before the high level software can run. So similarly, AWS EC2 can be bootloaded with the pre-configured instructions during creation itself by using user data. So user data can be given by two ways, like one we have, we have it here like the shell scripts and the cloud init directive, or that's basically a YAML file. And this is where the third step comes in. Uh, where in the configuration instance, you attach a user data script to bootload an instance and that's how you use it. So let's see practically how it's done. So welcome to the user data hands-on demo. And uh, what we're going to do here is we are going to create a, or set up a Apache web server with PHP. So the script that we have here is like basic uh, shell script. So the first thing that you need to remember is you need to provide the hash bank. That's really important for it to determine the path and you need to update the yum and then install the LAMP server, the PHP and the MariaDB. And you can uh, then ensure that the HTTP server uh, is up and running by using the systemctl command. And then you will add the EC2 user to the Apache group. And then we will go ahead and change the permission and ownership. And then we'll add the content to the site that we want. Uh, so that's it. So these are the information that we are going to put in, in the instance while creation itself so that they will be bootloaded once the instance is launched. Let's see how it works. So I have the script already with me. I'm going to copy this whole content and let's go and launch an instance. So to launch the instance, the same basic way that we have, you click on launch instance. So the first step that you have is choose an Amazon AMI that we already know, we're going to select this and you select the free tier eligible instance type. And you have all the basic settings already there, but there is something that is down below. That's the additional details. Here is a user data. So uh, you can provide the script as a text, as a file. Uh, so what we are going to do is we are going to paste the script here. So I've pasted the script that I wrote previously and I have the script ready with me here. And this is the user data that we are going to give uh, so that uh, the instance while it launches, it has all the configuration that I want. Okay, so now add the storage. It's same, you don't need to mess up with this. Click on next, add the tag, EC2 with Apache. I'll give it name EC2 with Apache. And then click on next and I'll select our security group. I'll select the one that I have and then click on review and launch. That's it. So once you have reviewed this, just click on launch 
and uh, acknowledge that you have the selected private key file and you have not lost it yet and click on launch instances click on view instance so now it is running so click on this what you're going to see is the public ipv4 address that you have as the script suggested that we have installed the apache server then it should be accessed from the internet isn't it so what we're going to do is we're going to copy this we're going to run it so i guess this is not working and there is a timeout isn't it <laughs> and we know the reason why so what we need to do is we need to change the security group for it to allow the http inbound traffic so we are going to edit this and add the rule add http port 80 and just remove the ipv6 and just save it that's it and now go back to the browser yes we have the site and that's how you allow permissions for http by using the security groups that's fancy <laughs> and we have learned it using aws so that's fun so now we have the page ready for us and you can see here it's written that you can add a index.html file in this particular path so we are going to do this what we are going to do is we are going to use a console so what we're going to do is we are going to just click on connect and start the console okay so we have launched the console okay that's cool so what we're going to do is now we are going to echo close the tag and the quotes and just provide slash where www.html slash index dot html that's it so now what you're going to do is you're going to go back to the site voila it worked that's the beauty of using aws you use the data so that you can uh, pre-configure your instance so that it comes up with any configuration that you want and the next thing that I wanted to, and I had a lot of confusions and I have seen a lot of blogs about this on how to actually launch an Nginx server using the EC2 instance. So I'll create one more and I'll launch an Nginx server as well. Okay, let's copy the script. So what we are doing here is uh, we are just updating the yum and I'll install uh, Nginx. And there is one more thing that you need to understand here is you cannot install yum just by typing yum install nginx there is something called amazon linux extra that provides you a package called nginx 1 or nginx 1.12 and that is how you're going to install it remember that and then i'll check the version i'll check the i'll start the server and I'll enable the server and then i'll change some permissions and then i'll add the html file so we'll let's copy this content and start a new server i'll go ahead and launch it I'll follow the same steps. I'll add the EC2 user data. Remember, it is inside the third step configure instance detail. You have to go down and there are advanced details inside which you have the user data. Click on review and launch and launch it. Yes, go ahead and see the instance. Yeah, it's up. So what we're going to do is we're going to copy the public IP address, the DNS name, and we're going to run it. So we have copied the public IP address and I'm going to run it yes it works happy new year everyone <laughs> and that's cool we have the nginx server with us and uh, that's how it works and uh, let's move on what i'll be doing is i'll be adding a link for all these scripts so that you can try them as well and i'll add the steps as well in the description so now that we have covered security groups ips and user data let's just recap the ec2 instant type once again because they are really important for the exam i know it's like i'm literally forcing ec2 onto you guys but you will understand the importance of this when you sit in the exam hall and uh, you have the questions related to ec2 so the first thing that we have here is the on-demand instance so you need to remember that on-demand instance is like spin-off and instance when you need them for a short workload and start stop or terminate them at any point of time as per your need and you pay as you go the next one you have is the reserved instance when you need something that you know you're going to use it for a long term and it may be used for a longer period of time like a rds database you go for this one so it's similar to the reserved one but you can basically choose to change the instance type if your load increases or decreases like if you have m1 you can change it to t2 or x1 or something so basically you can do that and uh, the scheduled reserve uh, scheduled reserve actually allows you to launch an instance at your desired time period when you most need it 
like a weekend if you are free and you want to run some workload you can schedule it and it will spin up at that point of time and the spot instance the spot instances are the unused on demand instances very cheap you can get them one for like uh, one third of the price based on the spot in uh, spot pricing bid for a price greater than the current one and you can use it it's a bit unpredictable because it might get lost if the bid price increases to the one that you have given so you must be careful so the next one is the dedicated instance you get to use an environment where you use the underlying hardware but you don't actually own it and the last one that you have is the dedicated host so you get the whole physical server to yourself you can spin up instances and control the instance placement as well so let's do a ec2 instance type rewind so the on demand instance is like pay as you go you are built per cycle per second uh, after the first minute that you have you don't have to pay anything up front no upfront payment no long term commitment that you have with that instance and it is recommended for workload where you predict the behavior you can easily predict the behavior and it is great for auto scaling and the reserved one that you have it gets you over 75% discount on the on demand one and you pay upfront for the usage and the reservation is for like around 1 or 3 years and you reserve a specific instance type like a database for that uh, period of time and the convertible reserve instances uh, get you like, around 54% discount on the on demand and you pay upfront for the usage just like the reserved one and the reservation period is similar to the reserved one that is for one or three years so this is where uh, actually the requirement comes when you have a need to change the instance type based on your requirement uh, like m2 small to x1 large or something and uh, the next one that you have is the, the next one that you have is the scheduled reserved instance so here what you have what happens is uh, you pay for the scheduled uh, time and even if you don't use it you need to pay you need to remember this line because uh, in exam they might ask you like uh, how is a scheduled instance basically built so you have to pay the scheduled amount even though you don't use it and it is a required term is like 365 days or the one year that you have and the capacity reservation that uh, recur on a daily weekly or monthly basis and they only support c3 c4 m4 and r3 instance types and you can purchase a scheduled instance up to 3 months in advance so that's a good thing next the spot instance the most cheapest one you get the 90% uh, discount off on the on demand instances it's just like the unused on demand instance so it's very cheap so price varies depending on the offer and the demand that you have for that particular instance and you can bid for the price and in that way you get you use this instance and once you lose your instance your data is gone you need to be very careful about it so here you get a particular instance dedicated to yourself but uh, there are no visibilities to the physical cores and the sockets of the hardware but you can basically use it and it has a dollar to region fee per instance billing that you have and you bill per instance and uh, that's the basic difference between the dedicated host as well but in the dedicated host what you do is you pay for the full hardware the physical dedicated ec2 server that you get it's very expensive uh, but it has a reserve for 3 years and you get the visibility to underlying physical cores and sockets of the hardware uh this basically is used for if suppose the client has a particular requirement that you need to have it for security concerns or compliant concerns then you can basically use this one so this chart is pretty much what summarizes the instance type so if you want you can take a print out of this and you can keep it with yourself for reference that might be helpful as well so let's go ahead and check the instance types so you have the instance types here and you can basically select from any one of them so they don't all come in the free tier account but uh, if you have the requirement in your organization you can particularly choose from these and you have one thing that you that i was saying about like the saving plan for the reserved instances you can click on this and you can purchase a savings plan like a flexible plan or a significant discount plan where you have a compute saving plan which provides the most flexibility and helps you reduce your cost by up to 66% and uh, next one that you have is a reserved instance i told you so once you click on reserved instance you can basically purchase it but it would ask you the type of platform that you need the tenancy that you want either it can be default or dedicated or any offering that you want like a convertible or standard that you have we discussed about the convertible one and you can uh, have a payment option like no upfront cost partial upfront cost and all upfront cost let's see if i go ahead and choose a dedicated and offering i make it standard and if i go for partial upfront and i choose 1 to 12 months and i choose a t2 micro and i search so let's choose a c4 x large and see the search criteria so what happens is for aws you get a 12 months term that i've chosen and the effective rate is 0.142 dollars upfront is basically 622 dollars and hourly rates would be 071 and uh, partial upfront so this is what you need to pay 
okay so if i give all up front and search it once again all up front would be 1219 dollars so this is how you basically reserve an instance but i'm not going to do it another one that we have is a dedicated host so you welcome to dedicated host and this is where you can basically reserve a dedicated host or a physical server so dedicated host allows you to provision ec2 instances on physical servers fully dedicated for your use so you can you choose the instance family that you want c4 or c5 or m5 or m4 then you can basically choose the type of the instance that you want and then you can choose the availability zone if you want auto placement or host recovery you can choose one and you can choose what the quantity that you want and you can basically use it but we are not going to use it and the spot request the next thing that we wanted to discuss is spot basically this is one of the interesting ones so once you have once you go into this page you want to click on request spot instance and there are four options here like load balancing workloads what happens is let's suppose i choose load balancing workloads and i go down and i select all the options that i have and once you come down you have a price here like let's suppose for c4 large the current price is 0.0251 per hour it's basically 75% off right now and if you want you can actually maintain target cost for this particular uh, amount that you have like you can bid around like 1 0.05 dollars or anything you can bid around like 0.05 dollars and you can keep it uh, for that particular amount if the spot price increases above 0.05 then you will lose the instance there is one more thing that i wanted to talk about like how to launch a particular ec2 instance you have the launch templates as well so what launch template actually gives you it gives you a form or a template form where you can give you can provide all the details that you need and it will create a template for you and that template you can use it to create the instance like let's suppose you give a template name a template version or a description that you have you choose the ami like what are the ami that you have linux to ami and the instance type and then the keypad login the one that i already had created and you choose the virtual private cloud or you can host it in ec2 classic cloud so and you can choose the uh, security group among the ones that you created you can associate a storage and associate the tags and uh, you can probably request for a spot instance and as well you can provide the user data here as well and you can create the launch template and use it to launch the instance this is pretty interesting and this is something that uh, uh, solutions architect should know so i just wanted to share this with you so let's move on to some serious stuff and it's very interesting as well amazon amis so we have been using amis for quite some time now that's the first basic step while launching an instance we have amazon linux 2 ami for our free tier account but what exactly are amis so amis or amazon machine images are a wholesome entity that provide information that is required to launch an instance so while creating an instance you specify the ami and you launch it that basically contains the snapshots and metadata necessary to launch a new instance so there are many different amis available already with us there is ubuntu there is open source there is red hat windows and amazon rds choosing the right image for the requirement is your job as a solutions architect so an ami has ebs snapshots or snapshots for instance stored backup emis and a template for the root volume like an os or an application so it also contains the launch permissions to which aws account can launch the instance from it and a block device mapping that specifies the volume to which it is attached and to the volume which is attached to the instance while it is launched so the ami life cycle is quite simple you create a ebs snapshot and then once you register the ami you launch the instance and from it you can either start stop or terminate when you want or you can just create a copy of that ami as well ultimately if you don't need it anymore you can deregister it as well so these are the basic benefits of creating custom ami so basically you can bundle your desired configuration or software into the ami that you want so you can have a restriction of what software gets installed on the ami uh, based on the organizational requirement and it helps in application update and maintenance basically because you know what has been installed then prior to what the instance that you are using so you can basically maintain them properly and it helps faster deployment for your applications let's suppose you have 
have a pre-configured uh, AMI where you have all the database and the operating system that you need and the configurations that you need. Uh, let's suppose in RDS you need a specific amount of memory that you want or specific amount of uh, users that you want to have access and um, basically you can use them and you can pre-configure them and once you have these pre AMIs already there you can basically launch them or create a copy of them for it to be launched and that helps speed up the process and you can have AMIs for specific requirements like web server or database as I already mentioned and AMI created are specific to the region and not global so any AMI that you have if you want to use it in any other region you have to copy that AMI first to that particular region and then use it and they are stored in Amazon S3 so you are charged based on the S3 prices itself and they are private by default and there is one place where we get the AMIs that's the Amazon Web Service uh, Marketplace where you can rent, purchase or sell your uh, AMIs and uh, basically there is one more thing that you can get the AMIs as well that's the public or community AMIs but we need to be very careful because they can have malware and they can, can pose a security threat to your organization if you are going to use them. So next thing that we want to discuss is sharing and copying of AMIs. So the first thing that you have is sharing an AMI with specific AWS account. So you can share an AMI with a specific AWS account without making the AMI public. It means that you have a particular AMI that you want to share with a particular account. Then you can just go ahead and share it by adding the AWS account to that AMI and it's not needed to make it public. You can keep it private and you can give it to a particular user or account. Uh, you need to share the CMK used if you encrypt your AMI. Sometimes you encrypt your uh, AMIs and there is a CMK or which is called the customer's master key and you can use that to basically decrypt the AMI and you have to share it as well. So to make an AMI region available as I already told you, you need to copy it to that specific region because AMIs are region scoped. So there is no limit on the number of AWS account and AMI can be copied so you can go ahead and use it as you demand. You don't need to share the Amazon EBS snapshot. So underlying snapshot that you have while you're creating the AMI does not need to be shared. That's something that we need to remember. The next thing is sharing an Amazon EBS snapshot. You can share the EBS snapshot by allowing the permissions. And if it was encrypted, you have to share the CMK or the customer master key as well. EBS snapshot are region scoped. So if you don't have that EBS in that particular region, you need to copy to that specific region, then you can make use of that. But this is very much tricky because sharing an EBS snapshot is really not secure. So you must be very sure about the people that you are sharing the EBS snapshot with. Copying an email. So what you can do is you can copy an AMI within or across any AWS region and uh, the AWS EBS backed AMIs and instance store AMIs are both uh, can both be copied. So both of the type of the AMIs can be copied. So an AMI when it's copied it's basically uh, has a unique identifier and once you make a copy of that also it will remain identical. And, and there is no effect actually on the target AMI if you deregister the source AMI. So let's suppose you create an AMI from an existing instance and uh, if you start that instance from the target and if you deregister the AMI that you had created it with, then still the target AMI would work. So there are no charges involved in copying the AMI as well and you can create copies of uh, any AMI as much as you want. So you cannot copy AMIs that are obtained from AWS Marketplace. So you have that particular AMI that we were using Amazon. So you need to launch it and then make a copy of it. So when you cross copy, uh, when you cross copy or cross region copy, uh, basically you, if you don't have that in any other region that you want, then you need to copy it. So basically that is called cross region copying. So when you cross region copy an AMI, it will first copy an instance store back to AMI to that region. It will create an Amazon S3 bucket for the AMIs copied to that region then. Then only it will be copied. So let's see how the AMIs work. So I have an instance here, the Nginx instance. And what I can do is to create an AMI, I just need to go ahead and click on create image by going to image and then create image. So you have the image, you can give the image name. Um, I will give it EC2 AMI Nginx. Okay, I'll give this boots with Nginx it's mine let's suppose so now the snapshot also gets attached to it and uh, we just now need to create the AMI create image request received and I can go ahead and close it so it'll take a few minutes but you need to wait for that but uh, it'll be good don't worry so now we have our AMI ready I had given the AMI name as EC2 AMI Nginx and the AMI ID is here and I am the owner the ID that you see here is the same one and the visibility is private and the status is available right now and if I ask you what do we do with the AMIs we basically right click them and launch an instance 
so we'll go ahead and launch it okay so it is pre-checked the choose ami is already checked because we have already so this is the one that we have created from our own ami that's fantastic so now as this is launched we can go ahead and test it whether our nginx server is working or not so copy this ip address the public ip dns and we are on the browser right now i'll just paste the ip address yes we have this so basically what we have done is we had this particular instance and we created an ami from that and we didn't add any user data to that but it still works and we have the data in place we have the configurations in place that's pretty epic so this is one thing that i wanted to share and this pretty much very important for the certification exam as well for the solutions architect certification so we need to remember this and this is pretty dope what i wanted to show you is you can create a copy as well or register new ami or you can modify the permissions of the image as well so if i create a copy of this and i select a destination region so let's suppose i select this one so i'm going to create a copy so now the copy has been generated and it's still pending so we'll wait for that to finish but uh, meanwhile what i wanted to do is i wanted to delete this and i wanted to show you if i deregister this one still the ec2 instance will work so i deregistered it we no longer have the ami if i go back to the instance this was this was the created ami and if i copy this and I paste it once again, it still works. That's the beauty of AMIs. So even if it is not there, if you have instance already created, you can still go ahead and use them. It won't affect that. So I was talking about the image permissions on who actually can basically copy or launch an instance from this one. Uh, this permission goes here, like modify image permission. If you click on this one, you can add the account number to this one and add the permissions. And basically, I don't have any other account, so I'll not add it, but this is how you do it. So when we previously launched the EC2 instance, we didn't tell EC2 to where it should be made available to us or our users or how it should be designed or architected. So when we launch a new instance, the EC2 service attempts to place the instance in such a way that all of your instances are spread out across underlying hardware to minimize the failure. But what if we want to let EC2 know where we want to place it? But what if we want to let EC2 know where we want to place it? That's where EC2 placement groups come and help us. We can use placement groups to influence the placement of the group depending on how our workload is. And we can use these three strategies to get our jobs done. So the first one is the cluster where you pack instances close together inside an availability zone uh, used for low latency network performance. And it is highly suitable for high performance computing applications like big data. So the next one is partition where we spread our instances across logical partitions within the availability zone and it is suitable for large distributed and replicate workloads such as Hadoop, Cassandra and Kafka. So the first thing that we have here is a cluster placement group. So what exactly you can see here is the cluster placement group is a logical grouping of instances within a single availability zone. So as you can see in the diagram as well, we have availability zone, the single availability zone and the single hardware rack inside which we have multiple uh, EC2 instances which are connected through high uh, which are connected through high bandwidth internet and which has 10 Gbps flow limit or 100 Gbps aggregate with non-blocking, non-oversubscribed, fully bisectional network. It provides the lowest latency and the highest packet per second network performance and it is used for high performance big data jobs. And it is always recommended to launch all the instances in a single launch request to avoid insufficient capacity errors if you try to add them later. So once you have created this particular type of placement group and uh, it is always recommended to launch all the instances at the single launch request uh, because if you try to add any instance later or you want to increase the capacity or you want to change any particular instance, it might throw you an insufficient capacity error sometimes. And stopping and starting the instance could result in the same error as well, but it will always run in the same placement group. But what is the solution then? Then what you need to do is you need to restart all the instances so that when they launch, they can be placed in a hardware which has enough capacity. So AWS will make sure that you have a particular hardware region that's having enough capacity. So once you restart all the instances, they will get placed to that and it will work just. But there are important points that you need to remember is the basic disadvantage of using a cluster placement is if the rack fails, all the instances fail at the same time. But what's the benefit out of it is you get to use a fast internet access uh, within the EC2 instances and uh, that can be used to do a big data job very fast. So this is one of the most important 
factors that we use cluster for and we don't use it for as well the second thing is the spread placement group so the spread placement group actually is a group of instances that are each placed on distinct hardware racks so as you can see there are different availability zones and in each of the availability zone we have its own hardware within which the ec2 instance resides so we have separate hardware for each of them and each rack is having its own network and power source so it is recommended for applications that have a small number of critical instances actually like few of them and that should be kept separate from each other so they can span over multiple availability zone but uh, they are restricted to seven instances per availability zone so i have shown you here three but there can be seven as well so if you launch an instance and there is insufficient uh, unique hardware the request will fail so what is the solution you need to wait for some time ec2 will make sure that you get a hardware available to you for you to use in a particular time span so that you can use it the third one is the partition placement group so as you can see here ec2 actually divides it into logical segments called partitions inside an availability zone we have here us east 1a the availability zone we have three partitions in that and we have three ec2 instances in each of them so each partition has its own set of racks having its own network and power source so last one the partition placement groups that we have here is basically like ec2 divides it into logical segments called partitions inside an availability zone as for the diagram that you can see we have availability zone here and we have three partitions partition a partition b partition c they have their own set of ec2 instances and they are placed in a particular rack and each partition that has and it's shown here uh, it owns their set of racks having its own network and power source and they are isolated that means that they don't interact between each other and they don't share any type of hardware resource and uh, they're used for applications like hbase or hdfs and cassandra and uh, it helps basically like if you if there is a failure in one of the partition the other partitions are not affected as they are not uh, interconnected or interdependent they are isolated so it's well and good so you can have a maximum of seven partitions per availability zone but they can spread across multiple availability zone in the same region so you can basically once you have created a placement group you can basically see what type of placement group it is and uh, based on what type of requirement that you have you can design a particular architecture around it so if you launch an instance and there is insufficient unique hardware the same way that we have discussed previously it will fail the request but if you wait for some time ec2 will make sure that uh, you have some hardware available for you so that you can use it so the last but not the least and it's the most important part that we want to have a recap on so these are the points that you need to remember for your certification and so let's have a quick recap on that so the first thing that we have is for free tier you use t2.micro instance and your build per second for windows you use the partial or the putty based on the windows version that you're using and for mac either you can use the terminal or item or terminus we use security groups to control traffic for our ec2 instance let's suppose we want http or sh we either allow uh, the inbound traffic for like 22 and 80 port so mostly the timeout issues are due to the security groups so let's suppose you're not able to access a particular site and it's getting timed out or on the terminal as well it is getting timed out so you can go ahead and check the security groups whether they have enabled them properly or not so the next thing that you have is when you get the unprotected key issue you go ahead and resolve the permission errors that we have done in the previous chapters as well so you can see them and come back again and uh, the security groups can refer to other security groups and uh, that's one more important thing that you need to remember that they can refer to other security groups and not the instances and use ec2 user data to provide instance boot uh, loading so basically you can load your pre-configuration or prerequisites that you want on the instance prior to them launching using the ESA2 user data and that basically helps us to so that basically speeds up the process it's very important to read about the instance launch types and the pricing associated to it for the solutions architect exam so you, there are documentations available so you can use them and i'll share the links in the description also so that you can read them and uh, be well prepared for the exam and you create custom amis to have a faster boot time and basically that helps you increase the productivity and performance in your organization as well and uh, to control where your ec2 instances are placed we use placement groups so these are the few points that we wanted to have a recap because these are really important and once we have a recap we actually tend to get them more into the mind so that's pretty helpful as well so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you how we create the placement groups so on the left hand side uh, you can see the network and security here you have placement groups click on that and you have the options to create a placement group so you can give it a name 
let's suppose I have cluster then I would give it a big data usage let's suppose I'm giving it a name so let it be so the cluster one that I have and I don't need to give any command line in face commands right now I can just click on create similarly I'll create another one my critical application then I'll use the spread and I'll create once again and I can create another one the partition one I'll give partition and I'll choose partition then enter the number of partitions to create in this placement group the maximum number of partition is seven so there are maximum of seven partitions you can create so I'll just create one so now you have the information like the group name, the strategy, the state that is available right now, it's available right now, and the number of partition that you have. But you must remember that spread, you can have a maximum of seven instances that you can have. And here you can have seven partitions. So these are restrictions that we have here. But we have created the placement groups, but we haven't attached it yet to any of the instance. So we need to basically create an instance or launch an instance. And in that step, we can actually attach that particular placement group. So for that, we need to launch an instance. I'll choose the Amazon Linux to AMI and I'll choose a T2 micro and I'll go for configure instance details. Here, as you can see here, this is the one place where we can add the placement groups. Either I can add this instance to a placement group to an existing one, or I can create a new placement group as well. So what I can do is I can add this instance to the placement group that I have already created. So we'll select add to existing placement group. Once you click on this one, you will get these two options, the spread and the partition. You can see the cluster one is not available here. But if I choose a larger uh, instance type, it will be available to us. So if I go back and I choose something like uh, m5ad.2lx large and go to the configure one yes i want to continue so if i choose this it will be available for us but i'm not going to review and launch anything because i don't want to pay there's a new year and i don't want to spend a lot of money on this one but it's quite informative so we now get to know like how we can place our instances in the placement group so this is quite helpful for us so here we come to the end of the very long session we had. It's very hard to cover each and every detail of information, but I try my best to deliver as per the needs of the exam. Uh, so in the next episode of Road to AWS, we will be discussing about high availability and load balancing, some of the most sought after topics in AWS Solutions Architect Certifications exam. So please don't miss out on that because we'll have even a longer session on that. I hope you liked what we did today. If so, please hit the like button, comment on what you liked, what you didn't, and please make sure that you have subscribed to the channel to ensure you don't miss out on any videos that I post because we are getting a step closer to our certification. So I would request you to go ahead and practice what we learned today. That's our motto, right? Learn once, never forget. So until next time, people, Pytholic signing out. Mm -hmm.